This is part five of a series about the very good chance that life exists on other worlds in our solar system. This time we'll be looking at the three most likely of the solar system's many ice moons and we'll find out why they could also be called ocean moons. These are Europa, Enceladus and of course Titan. Europa is the smallest of Jupiter's four large moons. Those are called the Galilean moons, named after Italian scientist Galileo Galilei, who discovered them around 1610. Galileo did not invent the telescope, but was the first to use one for astronomy, and therefore first to discover something. His observations that the moons orbited Jupiter conflicted with the Catholic Church's belief that everything revolved around the Earth. Galileo steadily refined the telescope design, but his early versions were 1 inch diameter 20 times magnification models. Now even toy store telescopes are far better than those Galileo used. Europa is a bit smaller than our moon and the sixth largest satellite in the solar system. Europa is even colder than Mars, around minus 160 degrees at the equator, while the poles are a frigid minus 223 degrees. Also, since the moon's orbit within Jupiter's radiation belt, Europa's surface experiences high radiation. The world has a very thin atmosphere of mostly oxygen, a product of radiation rather than biology. Space probe flybys began with Voyager 1 in 1973. Europa is next furthest from Jupiter after Io. So it experiences less tidal heating from Jupiter than Io, but more than Ganymede. That may be just the right amount. Europa's icy surface is very unusual. We can date the surface of a planet or moon from the extent of cratering. Craters are the dense inner world surface resulting from impacts. A lot of cratering indicates an old surface, a few craters mean a young one. Europa's southern hemisphere, the smoothest of any known moon, suggests a relatively young age of 10 million to 100 million years. The surface is young because it's mostly new material. The moon periodically sprays water into space which recovers the surface via a process called cryovolcanism. Cryovolcanoes are much like familiar volcanoes except the hot material isn't molten rock. Spectroscopic information shows that the spray is mostly water with some methane and ammonia. These substances solidify almost immediately upon exposure to the cold of space, then fall like snow to the moon's surface. Europa's cryovolcanoes erupt from that world's chaos terrain at irregular times, often reaching heights of 200 kilometers above the surface. Europa and Enceladus are the only worlds having cryovolcanoes. Europa's northern hemisphere seems much older. For now, no one knows why. The bits of Europa that are not smooth are interesting too. For example, Europa's surface is covered with long grooves, 5 to 10 kilometers wide and several hundred meters deep, which move relative to the ice sheet. This suggests a form of ice tectonics whereby Europa's surface ice moves around in big blocks like Earth's crust. We think warm water wells up from below and then freezes. Europa's chaos terrain is further evidence of the same process. All this activity, the ice movement and the water upwelling, strongly suggests a geologically active and hot interior. We know the moon gets considerable heating from tidal and other sources. Therefore, Europa must have an under ice ocean. That's confirmed by the same kind of magnetic evidence we have for Ganymede that indicates a salty ocean there. The sea salt and other minerals we can detect on Europa's surface are probably more evidence of seawater in contact with volcanic bedrock. This is good news for life chemistry. Europa's ocean at about 100 kilometers thick would contain about twice as much water as Earth's. The water should be somewhere between 4 and 77 degrees. How thick is Europa's ice crust? Some say 10 to 15 kilometers. Others say 150 to 300 kilometers. It's a critical question because the answer dramatically affects what we should expect for Europa's chemistry. If the ice is thin and porous, like Antarctic ice, then radiation cooked oxygenated organic molecules should soak into the ocean from the surface. 
In water, such molecules break apart into oxygen and other components. This could lead to an oxygen concentration equal to that of Earth's deep oceans. In that case, the high pressure conditions would create a complex organic chemistry, including the building blocks of life, amino acids and over 400 nucleotides. The oxygen environment would also permit the possibility of life more complex than bacteria. However, if the ice is thicker than 16 kilometers, and it probably is, then there's less chance that radiation created complex molecules from the surface would get through to the ocean. If so, surface oxidants would be unavailable to life. Some scientists speculate that life might obtain the same thing in a different way. The volcanic seafloor may produce earth-like levels of such molecules via water's reactions with certain minerals. That depends on how active the seafloor volcanism is. Without ongoing seafloor cycling and continual exposure of fresh rock, the available materials would become exhausted. Yet, although Europa probably only has one one-thousandth of the hydrothermal energy of Earth, this should be enough. Another key question is where does Europa's tidal energy go? If it mostly affects the Moon's rocky core, then the ocean would be enriched with negative ions. If the energy mostly affects the ice crust and ocean, that would stir things up like a great washing machine. Also, the water would be positively charged. The best scenario for life would be balance between the two types of charge. Our best understanding at present is that Europa's ocean should be rich in carbonate minerals. If true, many different pathways to complex chemistry should be available for life. Europa is now considered one of the best candidates for life. It seems to have all necessary ingredients. However, the lower volcanic energy compared to Earth probably means that any ecosystem would be thinly spread out, difficult to find, and pretty inactive compared to Earth. Another interpretation is that life could be rare overall, but rich in the immediate areas of hydrothermal vents. The liquid of Europa's cryovolcanic plumes is the same as that of the oceans below. The plumes could be sampled by a spacecraft, which would be like testing the ocean water only without the difficulty of having to drill through the surface ice. Enceladus is a small yet geologically active moon of Saturn. Structurally similar to Europa, Enceladus has no real atmosphere. Lacking any greenhouse effects, Enceladus is colder than Titan, about minus 200 degrees, even though both moons orbit the Sun at the same average distance. Enceladus also has an ice crust which may vary in thickness. It's not yet clear whether the moon has an under ice ocean spanning the entire world or whether the liquid is confined to the southern hemisphere. We know there's liquid under the surface because like Europa, Enceladus has cryovolcanic geysers. That suggests the same kind of tidal energy at work on Europa. The Cassini spacecraft in orbit around Saturn caught and analyzed some of the cryovolcanic spray. Ingredients included many organic molecules, other compounds favorable for life, plus mineral salts. This suggests that the water is in contact with volcanic rocks. So Enceladus is a good bet for life as well. Titan is the largest moon of Saturn and second largest in the solar system after Ganymede. Compared to Earth's moon, Titan is about 80% heavier and its diameter is 1.5 times greater. The first space probe flyby of Titan was Pioneer 2 in 1979. Titan is unique and more Earth-like than any other world. It's the only moon having a substantial atmosphere. That's about 1.5 times as dense as Earth's and has all the same layers as Earth's, although each is thicker on Titan. Titan's atmospheric composition is also similar to the early Earth's. It's mostly nitrogen, with about 5% liquid methane or ethane, taking the form of clouds, plus trace amounts of argon, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen. Except for argon, all those ingredients are building blocks of complex chemistry. Despite a strong greenhouse effect, the surface temperature is about minus 180 degrees. At that temperature, water can exist only as a solid, regardless of pressure. Even so, 
Titan is the only world in the solar system besides Earth having surface liquid. On Earth, the amount of water remains constant, although it changes through different forms. In the simplest case, the sun warms seawater which evaporates into the air. Eventually, the water vapor cools and turns back to liquid, falling as rain, hail or snow. Surface runoff starts as small streams which join larger and larger streams. Eventually, all streams return to the sea and the cycle starts again. This is the basic water cycle. Titan has rivers, lakes and seas, plus clouds and rain. However, under Titan's conditions, the liquid cannot be water. Instead, Titan has a methane cycle. There, methane, or a methane-ethane mixture, plays the same role that water does on Earth. So, whatever life may exist on Titan would have to be methane-based. Titan's surface is very Earth-like in other ways as well. Much of its surface geography would seem familiar to us. This includes various sedimentary and volcanic features. The volcanism tells us that Titan has a warm interior. Yet it's all ice geology. Titan is a world where water forms a kind of rock. In fact, at those temperatures, it's harder than granite. Titan's lakes cover about 15% of the northern polar region, less in the southern hemisphere. Some are hundreds of kilometers across and possibly tens of meters deep. The lakes are not permanent, as lakes are also not on Earth. Yet we don't know how long each individual lake lasts perhaps many thousands of years. Some lakes may connect to an underground ocean of liquid methane ethane. That layer may be in contact with volcanic bedrock, as we've seen for the other ice moons. In that case, Titan's volcanism would drive increasing chemical complexity as volcanism also did on Earth. That's in addition to what may be an even deeper subsurface liquid water ammonia ocean, similar to Europa's. That ocean could be 200 kilometers from top to bottom, below a water ice crust. However, if Titan does have a water ocean, it may be sandwiched between two layers of ice, therefore not in contact with volcanic bedrock, and possibly containing only very simple molecules. Yet, some scientists say that Titan's water ocean may be able to make complex molecules anyway. If so, that could mean that Titan may have two completely different kinds of life, one water-based and one methane-based, which never interact. The debate continues about whether Titan has a water ocean and whether it might be a good candidate for life. At least we know Titan's surface methane lakes definitely are strong candidates. Titan's atmosphere reveals a very active organic chemistry. In the upper levels, the sun's ultraviolet rays convert methane and nitrogen to complex organic molecules. The brown gunk from the Miller-Urey experiment called tholins via several pathways. Tholins fall to the ground, Titan's surface is probably covered with them, and remain in the atmosphere as a permanent haze. Apart from ultraviolet, Titan's atmosphere also gets bathed in cosmic rays. These are the most powerful form of electromagnetic waves, the kind of energy that includes light and radio waves. And cosmic rays come from intense sources within and outside our galaxy, not from our sun. Cosmic rays never reach the Earth's surface because our magnetic field blocks them. But on Titan, they do reach the surface. This provides an additional form of energy for cooking up tholins and other complex molecules. Although tholins are not especially soluble in methane or ethane, Titan's lakes should still contain them dissolved in considerable amounts. They should be quite nutritious for bacteria-like organisms. Laboratory simulations of Titan's atmospheric chemistry have so far produced more than 150 different organic substances. These include nucleotides, the units of genetic information, and amino acids, the building blocks of protein. Simulations also allow for the existence of a hypothetical cell membrane capable of functioning in liquid methane. Reality might be even more complicated than the simulations suggest. There are no theoretical barriers to life on Titan. 
Actually, it has the highest habitability rating of any world other than Earth. The Moon has several sources of energy, tidal heating, UV rays from the Sun and cosmic rays, plus prebiotic chemistry on a worldwide scale which produces all the molecules life could need. Certain predictions concerning Titan are very interesting. One is that life should exist all over the surface and that it would consume hydrogen instead of oxygen. If so, that should affect the layering of gases in the atmosphere. Specifically, molecular hydrogen and the organic compound acetylene should increase near the surface. Our understanding of gases predicts that there should be a million trillion time more hydrogen at the surface than in the upper atmosphere. Yet in 2005, the Huygens lander found almost none, while methane concentrations are very high near the ground. Clearly, something is using up the hydrogen and acetylene and making methane. This strongly suggests life. In 2007, members of the United States National Research Council Committee said that if life is a property of chemical reactivity, it should exist on Titan. If it doesn't, they said there would be something very wrong with our understanding. If Titan has life, its methane-based biochemistry would make it completely alien compared to life we know. The extremely low temperatures also predict that Titan's life would be very slow, but possibly long-lived compared to what we're used to. So all three of the ice moons we've examined are good candidates for hosting life, but none more so than Titan. But if it, if it exists, it could be totally alien. If you'd like to learn more, click on the next video. This is about the possibility that life can travel from one world to another. Thanks for watching.